So let's talk about chapter 7, which we're going to be introducing now, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, we discussed in our previous lectures that the first law of thermodynamics was a statement that described the conservation of energy. Now, the second law, like we mentioned in one of the first lectures we had, describes that there's a certain quality to energy also. There's not just a quantity. So the first law states that there's a quantity. We can't violate the quantity. A certain amount of energy has to be transferred from either heat or work or internal energy uh, or kinetic or potential energy. This, these all have to be balanced. The second law, we're recognizing that there is a certain, there are certain rules and boundaries to how this energy can be transferred. So for example, the heat from this coffee we know transfers from the hot coffee to the room or in the environment that we're in. We would never take this coffee uh, into a cooler room and notice that the coffee continues to rise and get hotter. Right? We just know that the heat is transferred from this hot coffee to this cold, cooler environment. Likewise, uh, in this example, let's say this is a spindle. This is a weight and we allow this weight to drop and these begin to spin in this chamber causing uh, the temperature to rise okay in this room so we've converted this mechanical work into a temperature we've produced heat in this box well this the opposite would not be true if we supplied heat to the box it would not help us to raise this weight back up so we recognize that there's a certain quality. So having just raw heat doesn't help us. But having something that can convert heat to work, that is a valuable, or, or work to heat, that is a valuable tool that we could use to produce energy. Here's another example where we have a resistive heating element, like your toaster, for example. And we pr produce a current through here. Right? If we have a current going through your toaster, voltage and a current, it would heat up the environment. Right? But we know that if we just heat up this coil, that it would not produce a voltage and a current. Right? So these are all illustrations of the second law, illustrating that things have a direction. Right? Processes occur in a certain direction. And they don't occur in a reverse direction. So in order for a process to exist, it has to satisfy one, energy has to be conserved, and two, it has to go in a certain direction. We can't expect it to behave opposed to either one of these laws. So I think we've described these first two, and the third we're going to spend pretty much the rest of this presentation describing the third. And the third deals with that there are theoretical limits to the performance of something to occur. Okay, So, for example, a uh, heat engine is going to be have a certain limit that it can operate between both a hot and cold reservoir. And I use the term reservoir here uh, before defining it. And let me go ahead and define it in this slide. So what we're talking about when we talk about reservoirs, imagine a, a uh, power plant, okay? And these are, uh, let's say this is our boiler of our power plant, okay? Something that heats up steam or water and converts it to steam. We're able to get heat out of that, and then we reject it to this reservoir here. So this reservoir may be the environment. It may be a huge ocean or huge body of water basically we're considering these thermal reservoirs to be something that we can change the heat um, change uh, or not change the temperature of or the thermal properties of even when we reject large amounts of heat okay into that reservoir so it has a large heat capacity it's a huge body that you know, no matter what we do to it, it's going to stay the same temperature. Okay, so that's a reservoir, which we'll be using to describe several other, this number three property here that I described, um, which is very important as well. Um, we also 
need to talk about heat engines, okay? Part of our analysis of the second law is going to deal with heat engines. Now, what is a heat engine? Well, a heat engine is able to convert work, mechanical work, into heat, right? So you can get heat from a high temperature source and you can convert it to work. And work is very valuable, right? We can convert this, uh, or, you know, we can either, uh, we can do a lot of things with this, right? So we can uh, uh, do a lot with this different types of work. I mean, we could make electricity, we can do all kinds of things. The opposite is not true in these two examples here. So we can make work to heat this water. We can't heat this water to make work. So it's very valuable to have something that can convert a high temperature source energy to a workable, usable energy. Now, this is very interesting too, okay? A heat engine, okay, we're talking about heat engines here. A heat engine has to operate between a high temperature and a low temperature source, okay? So that we have to have a boiler and we have to re reject some of this heat to a low temperature source. It's a requirement. So basically, we are required to reject some of the heat that has come into our heat engine. We can't convert all of it to work, okay? And we'll talk about that some more. And the fourth condition to define it as a heat engine is it operates on a cycle, okay? That means that we start at a certain temperature and we come back to that initial point by the end of the cycle, okay? So we start at one, go through our cycle, end at one again. Um, you may hear me refer to the working fluid and that's just anything that's used, like for example in a lot of power plants, water is used and converted to steam and then condensed back to water a lot of times in order to produce power. So here's an example of a uh, steam power plant operation. So we have a furnace or a boiler here we, or maybe our fuel, we burn that fuel, we produce a lot of heat, okay, we transfer heat to the working fluid here, which is water, okay, the water comes in here, gets converted to steam, we pass that very high energy steam through a turbine, then we have to condense that fluid again, and we put some more work into it again to re-energize the flow, and it goes through the cycle again. So this is a cycle right here, and it, it, it starts back, um, where it ended is where it starts back. So that's considered a cycle. Now here you'll notice that we do produce energy, this workout, but we also consume some of that energy in the pump to kind of keep this fluid moving through this system, okay? And you'll also notice that we have an energy sink, so we have to condense this fluid back down to water so over here it's steam we extract some of that energy from that steam and then we just have to waste basically some of that heat to an energy sink before passing it through this cycle again now the work hopefully in your power plant the work out exceeds what the work you're putting into your pump here right now this is what is going to be able to that's what the network is or what you're actually going to be able to use once you have completed everything in this cycle okay so you guys can see you may think in your head um, a major issue here okay major issue so far is this condenser if we're just wasting this Q out can't we just remove it okay can't we just get rid of this and save all that energy and use this energy somehow? Well, the answer is no, we can't just get rid of that condenser, okay? It's not possible because if we didn't have this condenser, we would not be able to return to our initial condition in this cycle. So one of the principles of the second law of thermodynamics is that there is a necessity to have this cold sink. And let me talk about that here in the next slide, but before I do, let me discuss this thermal efficiency. So thermal efficiency we're going to define as a ability for our 
heat engine to convert heat into usable work okay so we got this high temperature source and we want to use some of that energy maybe to make electricity maybe to drive a car engine maybe to do something like that well this is our um, this is what we would uh, the setup would be now some engines due to their design due to some of the considerations they made are more efficient than others that means they convert more of this heat energy into usable work okay um, how we're going to define or how you can define efficiency for one of these engines is uh, one minus the output what's coming out minus the input uh, so and you guys can see in all of these cases again we have a certain amount of waste heat that's just lost to the atmosphere and then the question comes up can we save Q out the answer is no we can't we have to be able so let's say in this scenario we have something that's hot just a piston that can move up and down here something is hot we heat up this gas chamber the piston rises because remember the ideal gas law you know uh, pressure will increase uh, and volume increases its temperature increases as well right so let's say in this system we're able to extract 15 kilojoules of work well we have to in order to complete this cycle be able to remove this heat from this system in order to once again uh, repeat this process otherwise it's just stuck in this in this process in this phase here and there's nothing really that we could do with it once it's uh, uh, at that condition so by definition we need to transfer heat to a low temperature reservoir in all cases okay for it one of these heat engines so that brings us to the Calvin Planck or Kelvin Planck statement that we are saying that it is impossible for any device to operate in a cycle and to receive heat from a single source and produce a net amount of work. So this would be a, something that violates the Kelvin Planck statement that we get 100 kilowatts of energy from this high temperature source and we're able to use all of it. We have to be able to expel some of it in order to operate in our cycle. So it's kind of a curiosity too that um, we are able to, we are not able to use all of this work and it has nothing to do with friction. It has nothing to do with other losses that are occurring in this system here. It just has to do with the nature of this system. We have to reject some of the heat here in order to continue in this cycle. Okay. Now what I want to we'll change gears a little we're talking about heat engines now let's talk about refrigerators now refrigerators work on basically kind of an opposite um, process here and it's very interesting to observe the uh, operation of a refrigerator so what a refrigerator basically does is it takes heat from an already cool space and transfers it to a hot to the higher temperature space okay so we're trans we're getting the absorbing the heat from let's say our cool refrigerated space to the surrounding air and here the example is in the kitchen okay so here's a typical um, refrigeration cycle where we have our fluid here typically is refrigerant and we've used it on several examples in the past refrigerant right we go look in the tables for refrigerant but basically we compress our fluid so it comes out heated <coughs> we condense that fluid here rejecting some of the heat to the environment we l allow this uh, fluid to expand and great through this expansion process it reduces the temperature and we have a large pressure drop that occurs here then we pass it through the evaporator where it once again collects heat from our refrigerated space then again repeats this cycle 
And if you guys feel behind your refrigerator at home, you'll feel heated air coming out through the back of your refrigerator. And that's the dumping of this um, heat to the our exit environment. So in other words, we are transferring heat from a cool space to a hot space. So it would appear that we are violating the second law of thermodynamics. But we have this, what you'll notice here, is that we are putting work into the system. And that becomes important later in another statement we'll define. To measure the performance of refrigerators, we're going to use something called the coefficient of performance. But in secret, this is also based, this is basically an efficiency value, okay? And it's called the coefficient of performance basically because it's weird to see an efficiency above one, okay? But its efficiency is described as this coefficient of performance using the similar definitions that we had before. Um, <clears throat> so our coefficient of performance actually. Uh, is greater than unity okay so our coefficient performance is going to be larger than unity uh, for these cases heat pumps are actually the opposite so if you want to imagine that a heat pump um, a heat pump takes air or takes heat from a cold environment and pumps it so uh, to a hot environment so can you imagine um, a heat pump would be an example if you turned your air conditioner around, okay? I like this uh, this example here. So instead of having the taking um, cool air and pumping it into this room, what Dagwood has done here is he's turned his air conditioner around and basically used it to heat his house, okay? So that's what a heat pump is. It's basically taking this heat from a cooled air and supplying it to a warmer space so if you take uh, maybe the outdoors four degrees celsius you extract heat from that cold outdoor weather and you pump it into your house um, after supplying some work to it so this would it would make this colder and would keep you warm in here okay so just like i said just like in the refrigeration cycle here it would be c collecting this heat um, that's rejected uh, to your environment from your refrigerator. Okay. Um, a couple note, a couple things to notice about uh, refrigeration type cycles. Uh, one is that as the outdoor temperature, let's say here, or not necessarily outdoor, but whatever the temperature is here. As this decreases, the efficiency of your refrigeration cycle is going to be decreasing. Okay, so basically the coefficient of performance decreases for different temperatures. So basically, don't refrigerate something too much or too cold if you don't need to, because it's going to take a lot of power to do that. Um, coefficient of performance that you can expect for heat pumps is between two and three and that's just basically a rule of thumb. So the last slide I want to talk about is the Clausius statement, okay? Clausius statement um, has to do, is similar to the Kelvin Planck statement and they kind of complement each other. But the Clausius statement basically says that we can't transfer heat, okay, from this cold refrigerated space to the warm environment without putting some work net into our system here. So here's the statement, it is impossible to construct a device that produces no effect other than to transfer heat from a lower temperature body to a higher temperature body. We need to have that work that goes into our system. So all of these are kind of a summary of the second law of thermodynamics. We're going to go into more discussion on different cycles, different ways to evaluate these and quantify the second law of thermodynamics in our next lecture.